Hello, and welcome to Speaking of Psychology, a podcast produced by the American Psychological Association. I'm your host, Caitlin Luna. I'm joined by Dr. Benjamin Carney, a professor of social psychology at the University of California, Los Angeles, and co-director of the UCLA Marriage Lab. Dr. Carney is a leading scholar of social relationships and marriage who studies change and stability in intimate relationships with a particular emphasis on minority populations, including low-income couples and military families. Welcome, Dr. Carney. Oh, thanks for having me. Happy to have you here today. So you're a co-author of a study that was recently published by the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology that examined what's known as demand withdraw behavior. And so to summarize that, that means uh, one partner in a relationship asks the other to change something, and the partner who's asked to make that change basically shuts down and withdraws. And in this study, you looked at how that behavior is impacted based, a bit impacts the couple's relationship satisfaction based on their income levels. So what did, can you explain what you found? Sure. And, uh, what we were building off of is an existing literature on the negative implications of the demand withdrawal pattern. So there's been a lot of research on marriage uh, that shows that when one partner seeks change and the other partner is invested in the status quo, you get this negative cycle where the person who wants change has to turn up the volume and ask more and ask more. And the person who loves the status quo, uh, which is often the male partner, Uh, but not always, has to withdraw to maintain the status quo. And then that means that the person who wants change has to get louder and louder. The person who withdraws has to get worse and worse. And uh, a lot of research that's been done shows that this pattern has negative implications for marriage. Mm -hmm. That couples that fall into this sort of negative cycle of demanding and withdrawing experience lower marital satisfaction, experience declines in marital satisfaction, experience higher rates of divorce. So that's the conventional wisdom. Mm The limits, the problem with that conventional wisdom is that all of that research, and I mean all of it, has been conducted on middle class or more affluent, mostly white, college-educated couples. Okay. So the advice that's available for all couples is based on research on a very narrow range of couples. Mm -hmm. And the assumption is, well, demand withdrawal is going to be equally bad for everybody. So it doesn't matter that we actually have never studied it in anyone except for a bunch of college-educated white couples. Our work questions that assumption and says, well, wait a minute. What if we think about uh, couples that are not affluent, that might not have gone to college, that might not have the same options that affluent college-educated couples have? What would be the implications of that cycle in that other context? And what we were thinking is that what makes demand withdrawal so negative for affluent couples is the presumption, the implicit assumption that people can change things if they want to in their lives. Mm-hmm. So if I'm asking you for change, I'm saying you could change if you wanted to. And so you're not wanting to. You're not changing means you don't want to, which means maybe you don't love me. You don't care about me. Right. In non affluent couples, in, lo- in couples that might be poor or disadvantaged, that assumption isn't true. Uh, you can't assume that people who don't change would don't change because they don't want to change. Couples that don't have resources might not be able to change. So let's say I'm a spouse and I'm asking my partner, hey, you know, you should make more money. You should get a better job. You should, you know, you should work harder for this family. Well, if I'm an affluent couple, I'm like, well, your failure to do so means you don't care enough. But if I'm a poor couple, your failure to do so might mean that you can't. I might be asking you for something that you cannot do. Mm -hmm. So for a poor couple, withdrawing in the face of that kind of demand might actually be adaptive. That was the idea. An adaptive meaning it's... It might actually help the relationship. That that might be the best available way of dealing with your demand would be to withdraw because I can't address it any other way. Okay. So we tested it. Uh, We were one of the, I think the first study ever that got a diverse set of couples and actually used observational data on poor and affluent couples. Most observational research on marriage took place only with the affluent couples. But we had a diverse, we we went out of our way to sample couples in low-income neighborhoods and couples that were more affluent. Uh, 
So we had a range of couples. And we videotaped them talking about problems. And we identified the demand withdrawal pattern. And here's what we showed. We showed this in two different samples. That the couples who were more affluent, the more they did this demand withdrawal cycle, the worse off they were. But the couples who were less affluent, the more they did demand withdrawal, the better off they were. Demand withdrawal, that is, every advice column says, don't do this. You know, don't fall your, don't allow yourself to fall into the cycle. That advice would have been bad advice for the low income couples. The poorest couples in our sample actually benefited from engaging in a demand withdrawal pattern. And so that's the news here. That and the broader lesson is the advice that we give to couples has to be tailored to their circumstances. The same advice that applies to couples that have a lot of resources might not apply. It might even be counterproductive for couples that do that don't have a lot of resources. And that's what we found. And a lot of your research, as I mentioned when I was introducing you, does include couple, you know minority populations. I would say, and, and not necessarily racial, ethnic minorities, but income minorities, military families. So, why do you think it's important to include such a diverse sample in your research? I mean, what can you explain your um, your commitment to that inclusivity? Absolutely. Um, there, there's two, there's two ways about it. I mean, for me personally, it's uh, it's an sort of an ideology that says science has not done a good job of representing the broader population or diverse populations. It's easy for a scientist, and I, you know, I, I, you have to, I have empathy for social science, which is a hard thing to do, to try to make it a little easier by studying conveniently available samples. Because, boy, science is hard, so at the least I can do is study an easy sample to get. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the easiest sample to get is white people, is people who hang out around universities who tend to go to college. It's a lot of extra expense, an extra effort, if I want to try to find people who are different than that, who are, who are somewhere else. It's only okay to look at convenient samples if the conclusions of that research apply broadly to everybody. Here's the problem. Okay. They don't. So uh, my thought is that to be a good scientist, you actually have to directly examine whether your findings generalize to diverse populations. And now there's a political reason to do this as well, or a policy-based reason, especially for me, a family researcher. Uh, and this is about, about uh, 15 years ago, or the early 2000s, there were policies put into place by our federal government to try to promote low-income families and, and promote the health of low-income families. And uh, this was known as the Healthy Marriage Initiative. And it was developed in the second Bush administration to, with a very noble goal, mm -hmm. let's help poor families that are struggling. The question is, what kind of help was offered? And the answer is, the help that was offered was help based on the research. Again, very admirable. Only problem is that research had only been conducted on affluent white middle class couples. Mm -hmm. So millions of dollars, what I mean is hundreds of millions of dollars, what I really mean is almost a billion dollars was spent over the next 10 years on programs to help low income families based on research on high income families. You can imagine what might what what, what the risk is for that is that 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 it, the advice and all that money got spent on programs that proved ineffective. And the, so the problem, so, so there's real consequences, like a billion dollars worth of consequences of not knowing what's really going on in those low-income couples. That is what motivates my commitment to studying the couples that haven't been studied. Mm -hmm. And going back to the results of that other study, um, is in those low-income couples, is too much withdrawal demand behavior unhealthy? Did you see how, you know, how it was prolonged? I know, I believe the study was over 18 months, correct, the period of time? Uh, it, it was. Again, there were two different samples there, and uh, we found the same general pattern in both. We did not see what, what you're suggesting is a curvilinear effect, an effect that there, a little bit of demand withdrawal might be good for those couples, but too much would be bad. We didn't see it, but that doesn't mean it's not there. It just means that one of the things that's true in that in both of these samples, we were studying younger couples. 
and uh, it's quite po- and so it's quite possible that the couples that we're seeing weren't the most distressed couples. It might be that uh, that if you're really studying maybe couples that have been together longer or couples that were really struggling with distress, that it, the, at the extremes, demand withdrawal might be bad or you know too much withdrawal might be bad for for a, a lot of couples. But we didn't see it. In the younger couples, the couples who were still together, who were moderately satisfied and committed to each other, we saw that a modest level of the demand withdrawal pattern was okay. By the way, to be clear, <clears throat> there's an effect, it, the way we looked at it, there's an effect of withdrawal. Withdrawal generally isn't a great thing. Mm-hmm. But right. withdrawal in the face of demand turned out to be an adaptive thing for the low-income couples only. Yeah, sort of giving that partner who is withdrawing a chance to like save face, if you will, as you like, maybe not face the reality, the you know the very basic realities they're dealing with. That's beautifully said. That's beautifully <laughs> said. You. Actually, <laughs> that in a condition where you cannot, you're faced with a demand that you cannot meet. Mm-hmm. Withdrawal might be the best of a bad set of options. Think of what the other options yeah. are. The other options are disappointing you directly or denying your demand or confronting you or getting mad or getting defensive. If those are your options, withdrawal starts to look better and better. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and um, you mentioned also, too, in the bottom of the study, you know, at the end of it, you usually conclude saying where future research could go. And you did note that future research could possibly be on same-sex couples or could be on older couples to see how it would play out in different you know, maybe not necessarily from the UCLA Marriage Lab, but from, from, from other researchers. Exactly. Our, our, uh, tend, our um, habit and our expertise is on the earlier years of marriage. Mm-hmm. And in the same way that I am very reluctant to generalize to diverse couples from the, only, from the couples that have been studied— I would be reluctant to generalize from what I know about the early years of marriage to studying the later years of marriage. Mm -hmm. You could easily imagine that uh, demanding the demands, the meaning of demand and the meaning of withdrawal might evolve over the course of a relationship. Couples have been together 25, 30 years. What does it mean to withdraw in the face of a demand then? If the demand is something like, oh, you know, I've heard this hundreds of times and it's not going to change that my withdrawal might be interpreted differently. It might Mm -hmm. have different implications. Right. And that's a future direction that we pointed out in that paper. Mm -hmm. So what can couples, what, what can couples do with this information? So they have the study saying that, you know, sometimes this behavior is helpful. Sometimes it's not helpful, but what can the, as the average person in a relationship reading this, what might they take away from it in their own lives? There are implications of this work for couples, which is, but I think the strongest implications of this work are for policymakers. I think the real audience for this paper isn't couples themselves, mm-hmm. but policymakers. Because for too long, policymakers have said, again, admirably, let's find the research and base our policy on the research. Unfortunately, the question they haven't asked is, is there available research that applies to the population we want to target? So policymakers, the 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 audience for this paper is to say to policymakers, you can't assume that a program that might work in an affluent couple is good, uh, affluent population is going to work in a low income population. That's really the lesson of this. So and the implication is, if I, as a policymaker, want to improve or target a particular population, I need to research this explicit to the population because this paper shows that relationships might function quite differently in those two different contexts. So I think that's really the, the, the primary audience and the primary value of this paper for making the world you know, a better place is that we might have uh, hopefully be able to start developing policies that are more targeted and based on more specific research that acknowledges the real differences in the way these intimate relationships play out at different levels of socioeconomic status. Okay, great. And uh, you know, moving on to your general research with, with the marriage lab, how do you advise couples to deal with the inevitable conflicts that come up throughout a relationship? <clears throat> so, right. Uh, a big issue, and that's just true in all the couples we studied, low income, middle income, and high income, is conflict. Now, uh, the way 
social psychologist, I'm a social psychologist. The way social psychologists define conflict really generally is any time that my pursuit of my goals gets in the way of your pursuit of your goals. So okay. whenever that happens, we've got a conflict. Mm -hmm. And if you define conflict that way, it follows that conflict's inevitable. There's always going to be conflict. I'm, we're always getting in each other's way. And the closer we are, the more we get in each other's way. Think about, you know, dancing. If uh, the closer we are, the more we're going to step on each other's toes. That's a good analogy. <laughs> so the issue in relationships isn't why do we have conflict? Because conflict is part of the game. We're not going to want the same thing at the same time all the time. We're going to have different desires for when to be on the couch and how often to have sex and what do we have for dinner and whether what time we mm -hmm. have kids and all of that. The issue for couples is how what, what do we do when we hit those conflicts? What do we do yeah. when we encounter those conflicts? And our research has talked a lot about what do the what do couples do that makes it makes those couples makes those conflicts easier to manage? And what do couples do that makes them harder to manage? So, and there's a lot on this. You know, we could go on and on, but there's one big issue that's come up is there are different structures of conflict. And we distinguish between vertical conflicts and horizontal conflicts. Okay. What's the difference? A vertical conflict is a conflict where one side is objectively right and the other side is objectively wrong. Let me give you an example. If you and I start arguing about what the capital of Portugal is, I actually don't know what the capital of Portugal is, but let's assume that we, dis we disagreed about it. One of us might be right and the other one would be just wrong. And we could discuss it until we convinced each other, like, this is the right answer, that's the wrong answer. Now, the problem with vertical conflicts is that we're almost never in them. Our conflicts are not typically vertical conflicts. The conflicts that relationship partners have are typically horizontal conflicts. And a horizontal conflict is a difference in values or preferences where there isn't an objectively right or wrong answer, where both sides mm -hmm. are valid. Yeah. Here's an example of a horizontal conflict. Let's go to dinner. I want to go to Chinese. You want to go to Italian. Yeah. Okay, that's a conflict. We want different things, but you're not wrong. It's not wrong <laughs> right. to want Italian. And it's, not, it's not like, no, Chinese is just objectively better. It's just we want different things. Right. Almost all conflicts are horizontal conflicts in relationships, but people approach them as if they're vertical conflicts. So if couples disagree in... You know, where should, what religion should we raise our kids? You know, one person's like, well, I, I, uh, my religion's right and yours is wrong. And maybe if I, see, if I think that I'm right and you're wrong. Or how, how often should we have sex? You know, what's the most appropriate time? Like, well, we should have sex the amount yeah. that I want it. Like, and you're wrong to want it your amount. You're like weird for too much or too little. Like, that's wrong. Yeah. That's when I think I'm in a vertical conflict, I'm going to try to debate you. I'm going to try to convince you that you're wrong. I'm going to try to instruct you, to teach you. None of that works. Yeah, it's not going to get you anywhere. It's not going to get you anywhere. <laughs> Nobody wants to be convinced by their partner or debated by their partner or instructed by their partner. And yet, if I think that there's a right answer and I've got it, that's what it leads me to do. So the advice that we often give couples is, Remember that you're in a horizontal conflict. Remember that you can disagree and both sides are still valid. You just want what you want. Your partner wants something different. If you start from there, now you're in a negotiation. If you start from there, you're not in a debate, but you're now in a, just go, okay, we, you want, you want, now we're going to have to talk. Can we compromise? Can we take turns? It's, you still might not get what you both want, but it feels a lot better to start from a position that both of our positions are valid. Yeah. And that's what thinking about horizontal conflicts does. So that's like one thing that couples can do to address the inevitable conflicts. That kind of sounds like politics too. I guess even that could be really, it's most likely a horizontal conflict and not a vertical conflict, even though we try to paint it as a vertical conflict. I know we're going off in a different territory, but as soon as you said that, that's immediately what I thought of. It's like, is it really one side right or wrong? It's more so different values and how do you compromise? So. Absolutely. Now, it's, it's a little off the topic of couples, and it's not my expertise, but there are social psychologists who've been studying the deep structure of political conflict. Mm -hmm. And it, of course, it is a values discussion. 
that the two sides are having. One side says, you know, the most important value is, let's say, equality. Mm -hmm. And another side says, equality, I'm not against equality, but the most important value is security. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not wrong to like security. I'm not wrong to value equality. We're just valuing different, we're prioritizing different things. But that's not how it's, that's not how it plays out in the political realm. Plays on the political realm, not that, oh, we want different things. How are we going to negotiate this? Plays out as I'm right and you are evil Satan. Yeah. Interesting. The same thing happens in couples, bringing yeah. it back. Yeah, Watch bring it back. That. Yeah, <laughs> bring it back to the relationships. But there's a lot of parallels. I mean, it's human interaction. <laughs> Absolutely. Stress couple, an unhappy couple, they don't just say, oh, we want different things. Mm-hmm. The unhappy couples say, why do you want, how dare you want what you want? You are wrong and and mean and malevolent for wanting something different than what I want, which isn't that is not a road towards compromise. That's not a road toward towards connection. Thinking about it as a difference of values allows you to say, oh, I'm not going to debate you. I'm not trying to convince you. Let's just negotiate, which always feels better, even though it's still hard. Is this advice you give to couples to how how to stay together for a, the long haul for a long period of time is to how to navigate these these conflicts and to see them in a different light. I, I mean, yes. Now, generally, we're you know, my lab is a research lab. I'm a social psychologist, not a clinical psychologist. You know, I, I'm not really in the advice business. That said, I, I do do research that I think matters for people, and I think has implications for how we live our lives. So, you know, we we always give the advice with a very light a light touch because it's. I'm basically saying this is an implication of the of the observations we've made in our lab. A second observation we've made in our lab around conflict also has to do with the psychological framing of the conflict. And it is, you can frame a discussion with your partner or even a disagreement with your partner as a specific problem or a global problem. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times we have flexibility in how we do that. And so, you know, if, if we're arguing about the toilet seat, it could yeah. be I want it raised and you want it lowered. Or it could be I think that I've asked for something and you don't care enough to give it to me. So the fact that you aren't lowering the to- toilet seat is actually a sign that you don't love me. You don't care about me. You're not paying attention to me. Yeah. Well, that second one is more global. Right. And it's going to be a lot harder a problem to solve. Right. It's not a simple thing. It's applied to a much larger issue. Exactly. The happier couples, the couples that manage conflict more effectively are the couples that keep it specific. Interesting. That keep their, okay. like, if we have a dishwasher problem. It's a dishwasher yeah. problem. I'm not going to link this to, I'm not going to say that the problem is you're a selfish bastard because if, how am I going to solve that one? Let's just focus on the dishwasher. Keeping So another piece of advice that sort of comes out of this work is the more that you can keep your specific disagreements specific, the better for your relationship. The, containing the disagreements, containing conflict is a good skill to practice. And shifting gears a bit, but you also have studied um, the health in, in, in relationships, not health of the relationship, but being healthy together as a couple. And you and your co-director put, uh, wrote a book called Love Me Slender, which is very cute play on words, but um, can you explain the importance of for couples for being healthy and, and how that helps a relationship? I mean, where's, where's that correlation? Sure. That's, so that's a book. Uh, my uh, co-director and collaborator is a guy named uh, Tom Bradbury, who's a clinical psychologist mm-hmm. at UCLA. And, and Tom and I wrote this book several years ago um, called Love Me Slender. And it, it came out of work that we had done on how couples support each other. And, and we had studied for years what makes couples more or less effective at supporting each other's goals. And it wasn't until some years later that we asked, hey, what are those goals? What are they supporting each other and doing? So we went back to, we had you know thousands of videotapes. And we went back and said, what are, in those discussions where they're given an opportunity to support each other, what are they supporting each other with? And what we found out is that over half of the couples we're asking each other for support about one issue, and that was health and fitness and diet and weight. In other words, their, their bodies. Mm-hmm. Couples, when they look to each other for support, half the time are saying, 
I want you to help me be healthier, either to lose weight or to eat better or to go to the ex- go to the gym more. Mm-hmm. So we looked at those tapes and we said, uh, are couples doing a good job at helping each other do this thing that they really want help with? And what we noticed in the tapes was, uh, on one hand, all these couples, we, we, together, we tend to study younger couples who are, are pretty happy, they're committed to each other. These couples wanted to help each other. Like they wanted to you, – you look at me and you're like, I want to be healthy. And I'm like, oh my god, I'm committed to you. We're going to be married for years. I want you to be healthier. Right. I want to help you with your thing. And yet it turned out to be a very hard thing to do. Providing effective support around health turned out to be fraught with difficulty. Huh. Let me give you an example. If I say to you, do you think I look fat? Do you think I need to go to the gym? What, what, what's the helpful response? To no, you look great. Yeah. No, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> now I don't go to the gym. I don't get healthier. Yeah. Here's another option. Yeah. Yeah. You do. You are getting some weight. Yeah, you should like, go to the gym. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. How's that feel? Yeah. Right. It's, a... it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough. So that's why we wrote the book. We're mm-hmm. like, oh man, it's not easy. Even the couples who love each other, it's not easy. So we started really looking into it mm-hmm. and, uh, what came out of the book was a couple big insights. And one is health is not individual. Mm-hmm. If you're in a relationship, there's no such thing as individual health. There's no such thing as, oh, I'm just going to be healthier because so much of our lives are interdependent. You know, if you, if you have a spouse or, a, or a co- if you live with somebody, how many kitchens does the average house have? The house has lots of bathrooms, only one kitchen. Mm-hmm. So you're going to be eating from the same fridge. So there's no way that you could just say, oh, I'm just going to have my fridge over here. You're going to have your fridge over here. That's just not yeah. how couples work. Yeah, and cooking meals and, you know, going to the grocery store and everything. Yeah. Absolutely. These are social events. These are – and so when somebody says, I want to eat differently, it affects their partner. And yet yeah. that's not how diet books are written. That's not how, how diet books are written. Diet books are written as if you change, make a change. You can't make a change that doesn't affect your partner. Yeah. So – you know, once you acknowledge that, you're like, wait a minute, I'm not going to be successful unless my partner's part of it. And that's a big part of the book. Uh, another thing that we pointed out is that providing support is thorny because people want help, but they don't want bad help. And there's lots of help that is the kind of help we all can do without, as my childhood book said. Mm-hmm. So uh, in the book, we have all sorts of examples from our tapes of couples that are trying to be helpful and kind of failing. And, and you know, one way is is exactly what you came up with, which is, no, honey, you look beautiful. You don't have to change a thing. And yeah. aren't, aren't I being loving? And I am being loving, but I'm not being helpful. Yes. So, you know, we talked about how you can thread that needle mm-hmm. and say, hey, I love you, but did you say you want to do something? Well, if that's what you want to do, I'm going to help you. Mm-hmm. Not because I think you need to change, but because I hear you saying that you think you need to change and I'm validating your goal. And, and we've seen couples do that. Uh, the example that we talk about in the book is uh, a wife who says to the husband, you know, I'm, and, and she says it with real sadness. I, you know, I feel bad about my body and I, mm-hmm. I don't feel attractive. And he says, oh, that's a big problem. It's a huge problem that you don't see the beautiful woman that I see when I look at you. That's terrible. What can we do about that together? How can we work on this problem? So he, and that's a real deft move that he did because mm-hmm. he he was able to say that's a serious problem. I'm totally on you're on board with helping you solve that problem. At the same time, that he was saying, I don't share the opinion. I don't. It's not a problem for me, and that's skillful. And so we wrote the book to sort of try to sh- articulate that skill and share it with others. So that's what that book was about. Great. And you've um, so switching gears to dating. Sure. Um, oh, dating. Dating. Um, you know, many people are looking for, for love on, on apps today, like Tinder, Bumble, OkCupid. And uh, you and I spoke a bit about this. And you said that how, we've, how we're dating has changed. So we're not maybe necessarily meeting someone at a bar or at work as often, perhaps we're using apps. But you said how are dating changed, but the actual dating, dating actions and dating itself has not changed. Can you explain that? 
Sure. It seems like I think it would, people would say, oh, it's totally different now than it was 20 years ago. You know, it, it, different people focus. You can focus on continuity and you can focus on change. And there's a lot that's changing and there's a lot that's staying the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's changing? So as tech... As technology, in other words, what's changing about in the domain of how do people find intimate partners? This is of interest to us. We study intimacy, so we're interested in how do people find intimate partners. And clearly, the technology available to do that is changing, and is changing a lot. Uh, whereas before, to find intimate, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, before we had smartphones, if you wanted to find an intimate partner, you had to go somewhere where people were likely to be talk to a lot of people and hope that you find the available people. Yeah. But nobody is wearing a t-shirt saying I'm available. <laughs> Some people might. <laughs> Some people might and good for those. <laughs> but for the most part, they weren't. You'd have to sort of like say, Hey, hi, are you interested? And like, no, I'm, I'm gay <laughs> or no, I'm married. Look at my ring or whatever. But now with apps, uh, you have a way of identifying people who are, Definitely available and local and willing to talk all before you get in the room. That's amazingly convenient. Like that's yeah. that's for some people life altering. Yeah. So, you know, if you were in, if you were at a job or a, a circumstance where you meet a lot of people, eh, maybe it doesn't make that much difference. But if you're a modern person that works a lot long, long hours, doesn't meet that many people at work, mm -hmm. but you want to meet someone socially, how do you do it? You know, the old advice is join a club, and that's still good advice. But now there's a new way, which is I can actually go online, and m multiple apps will give me a long list of people who are interested in dating me, who are relatively my age, mm -hmm. and who are within a short drive of my house. That's astonishing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the incredible. The marvel of it's modern technology. <laughs> absolutely. It's as astonishing as the fact that I can order on Amazon something in the morning, and it will be delivered to my house at night. If I live in a major city. So it, this is incredible, earth shattering. The convenience of it, that's the good news. Mm -hmm. The bad news is that some things haven't changed. And the, way, the establishing of romantic chemistry, well, that's not anything. That hasn't changed at all. And we haven't discovered any magic bullets for that. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, there was a period where the dating apps were promising a magic bullet that didn't really exist. You had dating apps like chemistry.com and eHarmony.com that were advertising very heavily with the promise that they had a magic algorithm that could select partners from the pool better than you could by yourself. That they would say, we're going to ask you some questions, do a magic mathematical equation and spit out people that you are guaranteed or at least have a high likelihood of matching with. That turned out to be snake oil. That has now been very well established to be bunk. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was a persuasive idea. It was an appealing idea. Lots of people paid a lot of money for it. And the reason they paid a lot of money for it is that there's something compelling about the idea that if I give you a list of what I want in a partner, I want someone who votes like me, who likes Chinese food, who enjoys watching HBO limited series and, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> likes modern jazz. And if I find someone like that, great. I'm probably going to like that person. That assumption turns out to be false. Yeah, you said that it doesn't necessarily mean you'll hit it off just because you have the same interests. At all. Yeah. It doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is that we have th thousands of interests. And anyone you meet... If, it's not that if I share my in, the, the right interests with you, I'm going to like you. It's the opposite. If I like you, we'll gravitate towards the interests that we mm -hmm. have in common, and we'll gravitate away towards the interests that's, that we don't have in common. Within a broad circle, you know, I want someone who's nowadays someone who generally shares my politics. Nowadays, it's 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 being of the the opposite or being of the wrong political party is more stigmatized in dating than being of a different race or religion. Wow, that's that's, that's a new development. Yeah, I said how how long has that been happening? Do you think? Uh, you know, in in our li in my lifetime, too, in the last twenty years, that kind of polarization, people have said, I wouldn't mind if my child came home with a partner of a different race, but I would never want my child to come home with a partner of a different party. 
Wow. So it's not super recent, but that's the, said it is super recent decades, that it's decades, but not necessarily in the past like two or three years. It but, speaks to the to the divi- yeah. divisions in the country. Yeah, but there's lots of people who share your political persuasion in the world. There are lots of people who share your religion, and within that, it turns out that a list of things you like, a list of your hobbies, doesn't predict who you're going to like romantically. Because it turns out that romantic attraction is not about these sort of stable characteristics or or, or interests. Mm-hmm. Romantic attraction has a lot more to do with behavior, interaction in the moment. Romantic attraction arises from how the exchange of behavior makes me feel. And if it yeah. makes me feel, you know, understood in the moment, and it, your capacity to behave in a way that makes you feel understood and excited and interested has to do with what you do, not, you know, what foods you like to order in from. Once you, once that feeling arises of romantic chemistry, then people look for, well, what do we have in common? Oh, we have this in common. Great. Let's go do that thing. Mm -hmm. And people are complicated. We'll find something we have in common. So um, that's why no matter how much you work on your profile, no matter how, how many hours you study the other person's (laughs) profile. You're not going to know what's going to happen when you meet until you meet. meet, Yeah. So dating apps can do something great and there's something they can't do. They can find people who are available. Mm -hmm. Which is helpful, obviously. Which is very helpful. It's amazing. But they can't tell you who you're going to like. Only interaction Mm -hmm. can tell you who you're going to like. So how was the, the apps are great. Use them, find people, and then get in front of them. So is that your advice to dating in 2018 and moving forward? That's just the, still 2008. Just get away from your phone. <laughs> yes. Meet in person. You, you could, or, or even Skyping. Like yeah. there's, you know, yeah. something, this FaceTime interaction, group, yeah. the, the, the face-to-face, the FaceTime as it were. But um, but I wouldn't spend that much time working on profiles because profiles are not where it's happening. Great. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add? Any other research you wanted to talk about or other topics? Back to the policy issue. The things that that I'm interested in pursuing are what are the other hidden ways, invisible ways that public policy affects intimacy? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Because this is not something that gets discussed a lot. When, when we talk about public policies like health care, like tax increases or decreases, like the minimum wage, all of those big public policy discussions are discussed in terms of, well, how will it affect income? How will it affect employment? How will it affect, you know, uh, debt? The implication of some of the work we're doing lately is that all of those policies should affect intimacy as well. Intimacy, uh, the decisions people make, should I get married? Should I have a kid? Am I satisfied with you? Are very much affected by the policy environment in which it takes place in which these decisions take place. So uh, one of the things that we're interested in pursuing is looking at the very private, intimate implications of these very public global policy changes. And um, so that's something that that we're pursuing now. And we're specifically doing analyses on what happens to marriage and divorce in states that raise the minimum wage. Interesting. You'd think that for poor couples, There might be a, an effect, and it seems like there is, but that's that's really, you know, I shouldn't talk about that too much because that's still work we're mm-hmm. working on right now. That sounds fascinating. But the implications, it follows from the paper that we started talking about, mm-hmm. which is if you want to help couples, you can help them by trying to teach them stuff. You can help poor couples by trying to teach them stuff. Or you can help them by making their lives easier. And it turns yeah. out that, there's some evidence that if you make people's lives easier, intimacy improves even if you don't teach people anything. Huh. That's very interesting. It's like, and so it's a much, you think of relationship as just a small thing here, but it can obviously expand out more and to include a lot of other factors. You've heard the expression, the personal is political. Mm-hmm. Uh, the political turns out to be personal yeah. as well. <laughs> And I actually just uh, off the top of my head, I read an article recently about how the divorce rate from millennials is going down. Yeah. Or how, I mean, I'm just, you know, you know, it's just a new information shared, but, you know, basically it was saying people are choosing to marry later, 
you know, changing their habits in that way. So that, that's interesting as well. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I read that same article and uh, the analysis showed very clearly that divorce rates are declining for millennials who went to college. Okay. It's okay. not true not of couples okay. who didn't go to college. And so, and here's the point is that nowadays people who have access to education and have access to good careers are delaying marriage until their education and careers are in place. So people who get married once their education and careers are in place have more stable marriages. Makes perfect Makes sense. sense. Yeah. Uh, people who don't go to college are delay are, are marrying less, but marrying earlier. And mm -hmm. when they marry, they don't have careers in place, then their lives are going to be harder and they struggle and their marriages struggle too. Makes perfect sense. That's really fascinating. Interesting. It'll be interesting to see what comes of that and, you know, if more studies are done or what news comes of that as we move forward. Absolutely. Right. I'm very interested in as well. well. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Carney. It's been a really fascinating talk. Caitlin, thank you for having me. I, I'll have this chat with you anytime. Speaking of Psychology is part of the APA Podcast Network, which includes other great podcasts like APA Journal's Dialogue about the latest and most exciting psychological research and progress notes about the practice of psychology. You can find our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also visit speakingofpsychology.org to find more episodes and to view resources on the topics we discuss. I'm your host, Caitlin Luna, for the American Psychological Association.